Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts, of George Mason University and Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, find other episodes, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is November 18th, 2010, and my guest is Nicholas Philipson, Honorary Research Fellow in History at Edinburgh University and the author of Adam Smith, An Enlightened Life. Nicholas, welcome to Econ Talk. Thanks so much for asking me. So a biography of Adam Smith is a big challenge uh, for a whole bunch of reasons. One is, of course, his intellectual status and his contributions to the world, but also because of what we do and do not know about Smith's life. So talk about the process of writing this book. Well, it is is indeed a challenge um, at a technical level, actually, um, which is not altogether usual um, when you're dealing with 18th century um, thinkers. Because the thing is that Smith is very badly documented in conventional ways. Um, We don't have much in the way of correspondence, what correspondence we have comes from a very late period of his life. Um, and one of the reasons for this is that Smith kept himself to himself and at the end of his life had a great bonfire of his papers. Nearly everything he had was destroyed. Not everything, but nearly everything. And that means you had to try and bring Smith to life and to try and make sense of what he wrote um, without being able to draw on conventional um, biographical sources. And so what I decided to do when I started uh, was to try and say the only way of bringing Smith to life is via his text. What I've got to do is bring his text to life in a historical way. And what bringing them to life in a historical way means is, in fact, putting them in a local historical context. Because Smith wasn't speaking to eternity. He wasn't speaking to our generation. He was speaking to his own generation. And he was doing that in a way you all understand very well. Um, He spent uh, much of the creative part of his life as a university professor. Um, And he is addressing um, an audience of educated, intelligent students. And beyond that, an educated, intelligent public who had their own preoccupations, um, their own intellectual backgrounds, and um, their own intellectual experience. And I think one of the fascinating things about reading Smith is to read him in that particular context, as someone who is addressing people to, in, who, who lived in the world to which he belonged, and not addressing us two centuries later. Well, that was the uh, uh, immediate challenge of doing it, and I found it enormously interesting, because what came over to me uh, in doing this, and particularly in working through student notes of his lectures in Glasgow, was what an enormously authoritative uh, lecturer Smith was. Smith comes over as a great revisionist. He's a great one for standing up in front of a class and saying, most of the stuff you read on this subject is wrong. Most of, some of it is ridiculous. Um, he's, he really is an iconoclast. And I'll tell you what interested me about that. Smith is a deeply shy, retiring man in yeah. ordinary private life. And I found that one of the themes running through um, his life as a historical figure, living in a particular time, in a particular place, was this mixture of personal shyness and awkwardness, but enormous authoritativeness and and daring intellectually. The moment he got up on his hind legs and started talking to his students or started writing for his audiences, he almost becomes a different sort of man. And I found that very intriguing. Yeah, the theory of moral sentiments uh, does not appear to be written by a shy man. It's an aggressively, as you say, authoritative set of fascinating observations about the inner life of all kinds of people, certainly people that Smith knew. But you'd think he'd know them pretty well, and for a shy person, it's a little bit shocking. It is. I mean, uh, he goes far more deeply into the process of how – um, the, how the human personality is made, how we acquire a sense of identity, 
um, than virtually anyone else, apart from Jean-Jacques Rousseau, um, with whom he had a rather awkward relationship, in literary relationship, that is to say, um, throughout his life. He is a very, very revealing person, and as you say, for a shy person, that is, that's intriguing. That's really intriguing. But I do think that one of the things that's fascinating about the theory of moral sentiments in that context is to look at the examples he gives of how we respond to different sorts of social pressures, social circumstances. And the examples very often seem um, rather dated to us. But the thing I found interesting was just how much he is drawing on con what in contemporary terms were conventional examples. Um, it, um, in literature, uh, in, in 18th century moral journalism and so forth, examples that his, his, con his contemporaries, his students would have recognized the moment they heard them. And what Smith does is he takes these familiar examples that, that by and large people know about and he then presses them harder and says, let's start with what we all know. Let's press it through and theorize this, these examples. Mm -hmm. And it's the way in which this intelligence takes ordinary, everyday experience of ourselves functioning as moral agents uh, in the ordinary world in which we live and presses these, these examples further and simply invites us to think more and rather more clearly about the implications of what we're saying and to begin to um, take the, our courage in both hands and to begin to think in, in, in theoretical terms about the example that we've taken for granted. And of course to us, some of those examples, as you say, are a little bit obscure. Some of the references in philosophy are things that a, that a person today is not as familiar with. On the other hand, there are many examples in the book of, of social phenomena that are timeless. Uh, Absolutely. Guilt, shame, pride, um, the pursuit of money, um, dignity, integrity. These are the themes that run through the theory of moral sentiments that are timeless. And even while the examples may be a little bit dated, and I referred to one recently incorrectly, but the right example is I think is a tweezer case, the, uh, the obsession with the latest gadget. That hasn't changed at all. The gadgets have changed, but um, the obsessions are, also, are unchanged. This is absolutely right. Um, uh, um, um, the, it, it is true. I mean, the, the, um, the, the, the situations repeat, and in fact, my favorite one um, is to centralize the thing that everyone knew then and knows now, our disgusting um, obsequiousness uh, in the presence of the of the great and the rich, uh -huh. and of course we feel that particularly in in uh, in, 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 in the United Kingdom, um, I, uh, living in a monarchy as we do. I mean the, abs the absurdity of, uh, of the way in which we 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 regard and grovel uh, to uh, to wealth and status. And again, what I think is absolutely wonderful, and this really does leap across the centuries, is Smith's realization of just how much this. Um, the, 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 there is a language of deference which is absolutely essential to the maintenance of social order. And I think it's one of his most graphic examples of how the invisible hand um, does its magic. I mean, we, we tend to assume that the invisible hand only works uh, in the market uh, and in, 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 in a situation in which, we, um, uh, in which we pursue our own interests without realizing that the invisible hand uh, will, in fact, um, aggregate those um, uh, uh, those individual efforts um, and work for um, the, um, a, a common good. This this sort of trick of Smith, this this, uh, this calling up of the invisible hand, works everywhere and nowhere uh, more influentially than explaining the patterns of social deference. Um, I, yeah, I agree. That exist in any society we know about. I agree with that, and having read. The theory of moral sentiments, uh, very late in life, ashamedly, um, it, it it breathes through that text in a whole bunch of places without using the language, and he invokes often uh, the creator uh, as the underlying source of this unseen order. Uh, he doesn't talk about the the unseen order literally. He doesn't use the invisible hand. Often, obviously, in the theory of moral sentiments, but he certainly he invokes it. I don't, I don't know whether that's in the earlier editions or in the later editions, 
whether it runs through the whole, you know, he as as our listeners know, he wrote that book first, but revised it late, and um, but it clearly has that metaphor in it. I mean, he he uses it in the early editions, um, but I mean the um, it, the device is absolutely essential to his theorizing at every conceivable level. Um, I mean, you could you could trace it in his earliest lectures on rhetoric, and in his lectures on jurisprudence as well. It's absolutely fundamental um, to the whole intellectual frame of mind. So let's let's go back and and let's talk about the little that we do know, the detail of biography. Talk talk about what we know about Smith, about where he lived, uh, what about his personal life that we do know the handful of, of works that we have of his uh, that have survived. So talk, just give us a quick sketch of the, of the, right. the facts. Well, um, he belongs in social um, and political terms to um, a mainstream of Scottish society. Um, if ever there was a person who came from a, um, a, a typical section of society, it's Adam Smith. Um, his... Um, family, his friends, uh, belong to what in the 18th century were called the middling ranks, which is not just the middle classes, but it's, 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 it's a merchant professional class to which it added the lesser landowners. In, in Scottish terms, the Scottish word for that is lairds. The English word would be gentry. He comes from that section of society. The people he, the family he was born into, the people he knew, the families he knew, were people actually who were on the side of the existing regime. They were families that had done well out of the glorious revolution of 1688. They had done well out of the Act of Union. Um, they had done well out of the wars that um, Britain was engaged with with France. I mean, there was, there was evidence of contract, uh, contractors making money off armaments and all the rest of it. Um, and these, this was a family that had, to, uh, that had to invest its money, and it invested it in a rather interesting part of Scotland, um, north of Edinburgh, on the other side of the Firth of Forth, um, in, the, uh, in, 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 in the county of Fife, and based on the town of Kirkcaldy. Um, and this is where he was brought up. The, the family and friends among whom he's brought up are incoming landlords, they're improve, improving-minded landlords. They're people who buy themselves into run-down estates, into post-feudal estates, and they're interested in modernizing them. Um, these are people on the make. These are people who are going to do things. Um, and as I say, Smith is born uh, into that world um, as a, a rather sickly child, and he actually wasn't expected to live. And born as the only son uh, of his mother, his father having died before he was born. And I think that in this rather slightly offbeat part of Scotland, in this sort of modernizing, improvement orientated if you think in 18th century terms, um, gentry come professional class, come middling ranks of Scottish society, um, he, um, he lives in that, in, in that world almost exclusively in the company of his mother. His mother, an enormously formidable woman. There's a portrait of her, which is, um, uh, 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 which is well worth consulting. That was a lady you did not mess with. Smith, his relations with Smith are very close, and Smith grows up as a slightly sickly, rather odd, very clever boy. And the, one of the things that intrigues me, um, um, in addition to his authoritative manner, his diffidence, is that absolutely everyone likes him. It's very, very interesting. It's difficult to find in the backbiting world of the Enlightenment, either in Scotland or elsewhere, um, people who don't have enemies of some sort somewhere along the line. No one disliked Smith. And I can't quite pin down myself why that was. But that's beside the point. He grows up, as I say, in this slightly offbeat part of Scotland. Um, he, um, he actually goes to the local school in Kirkcaldy, and the local school is something I'd like to know much more about because it had just been taken over, uh, probably with the influence of one of these incoming families, by a very avant-garde schoolmaster. 
And Smith got, rather surprisingly, a very good and not particularly conventional education, strongly based on the classics. Um, it introduces him to classic philosophy, and it also introduces him to some uh, uh, inkling of contemporary British um, philosophy. Um, he then goes, um, at the age um, of 12, from there to, um, to Glasgow University. And Smith is very, very lucky. He goes there in 1736, and Glasgow University has just been put through an absolutely major refit by the people who ran it, um, um, headed by the effected Prime Minister of Scotland, the Duke of Argyll at that stage, or well, he was then called something else, but he would be the Duke of Argyll. And what has, what has happened was that the university, which had been um, uh, a hotbed of radical Presbyterian thought for quite some time, is being cleaned out and is being turned into a moderate Presbyterian university. And uh, um, this resulted in the, um, uh, in the development of departments um, which were to be of huge importance to Smith. So much so that he's given a first-rate education in natural philosophy and introduced to Newtonian, uh, Newtonian science based in a, in, in a thoroughly sophisticated way. Even more important, he is taught by one of the greatest mathematicians in Europe, a man called Robert Simpson, to whom I believe he owed very, very much more than historians have normally allowed. And then um, the icing on this, this, this very rich intellectual cake was that his arrival in Glasgow coincided with the arrival of Francis Hutchison from uh, Dublin, um, an Ulster Scot who is made Professor of Moral Philosophy and gives Smith an absolutely superb introduction to the state of moral philosophy in the ancient and the modern world. And as I say, Adam Smith called him the never-to-be-forgotten Francis Hutchison. Hutchison was a nice guy. He was a great teacher, much beloved by everyone. And he is a formidable moral philosopher. He is also, and this is fascinating and important, he is a very devout, moderate Christian. Um, uh, and this will matter in Smith's life. Well, Smith then um, sticks to Glasgow, um, leaves for um, a special scholarship to Oxford University and to Balliol College, Oxford, in 1740. And he goes to somewhere he hates, and if you want to see how much he hated it, look up the section in Book 5 of The Wealth of Nations where Smith discusses the role of universities in the <laughs> modern state yep. and, and lets his hair down about the state of teaching in Oxford. He's not a fan. But, I beg your pardon? He's not a fan. He is certainly not a fan. I, I, if, if Smith hated anything or anyone, I think it was Oxford University. But it, 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 it's an interesting period in his life because he's there for six years. It was a, a, a pretty, it was a nice scholarship to have. And basically, he was left to himself. And I think that was actually quite important. This very, very clever boy who has been given a very carefully structured education and a sophisticated education at Glasgow needed, I think, time just to breathe. And he reads absolutely copiously, because one of the characteristics of Smith is that he's a polymath. He reads absolutely everything. And he read loose on um, the libraries in and outside Oxford at that time. He really does seem to have um, absolutely saturated himself uh, with um, the history of philosophy, the history of jurisprudence, the history of rhetoric in particular. And because, um, as we all know, um, Satan finds work for idle hands to do, um, Smith found himself not being properly supervised by college tutors who didn't have much to do with him, as far as we can see. He comes into contact with the writing of the of really Britain's greatest infidel, David Hume. And which I take to be um, an absolutely pivotal moment in Smith's intellectual development. We don't quite know how, exactly when and exactly under what circumstances 
he came into contact with the philosophy of Hume. But for various reasons, I think it must have been at the very end of his, or, or the middle to the end, the second part of his stay in Oxford. And um, I argue in my book that this is a transformational experience because it actually, first of all, um, gives um, Smith an approach to the study of moral philosophy and therefore the study of human society. It gives him an approach which rejects any religious premise as a legitimate premise on which to base your reasoning about the principles of human nature. And it provides a methodological alternative and, a, and an experimental method which can be used if you cannot make these sorts of assumptions about human nature. And as I say, I think this brings to an end the first part of Smith's education by the, about the age of 23. Smith, having gone through a surprisingly sophisticated education, Smith having stumbled or run into contact with David Hume's works, although not the philosopher himself, that would come later, um, and Smith as a diffident but extremely ambitious um, and uh, uh, um, young philosopher prepared to take on the world of modern philosophy and put it to rights um, and absolutely raring to go at the age of 23. And it's from about that stage, from 23, uh, when he returns to um, Scotland from uh, Oxford uh, in search of a career that his adult, um, his, his career as a philosopher begins to show, begins to become recognizable. So tell us, he um, the part of the story that I find really quite extraordinary, and I, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to lead you a bit. So I want you to continue with the with the narrative, but I, I want you to think of this question as you go through it. He's going to he's going to give some lectures. He's going to be successful as a professor. People are going to like the lectures. Um, he writes a book that is well received, the Theory of Moral Sentiments, um, and I want to talk a little bit about. What kind of a book that is? I found it. I find that it's it's a bit strange in how it's organized and its style, but there's some marvelous, extraordinarily entertaining and enlightening things in it, and it's a, the book's a success. And at some point, is a better way to ask: Is there any any point until 1776, before 1776, where you would say this man has in him? Not just a successful career as a professor, not just a thoughtful book on moral philosophy, very influential, very successful, but the book that's essentially going to launch the field of economics into its modern era. Not just a clever book, but a massive book of tremendous ambition, a book of many, many words. As you say, he was a polymath. It's full of extraordinary, diverse insights into behavior activities all around the world it's just an amazing book and who would have thunk it <laughs> who would have imagined when he was 23 certainly you wouldn't have thought that so somehow he has almost i would almost say he has the nerve as you say he was highly ambitious he has the nerve to to write this tome this this rocket that takes off so take us from 23 to that book with that sort of a puzzle in mind. Yes, indeed. I mean, it's, it, 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 it's one of the great historic questions. Um, I think what one has to say is that Smith, from the very first time that he starts to appear as a public philosopher in Scotland, from 1746, um, or, or probably 1748 or 9, uh, when he, he starts to deliver philosophy as um, a public lecturer in Edinburgh, he is, I think it's worth remembering that he's working at that time on an enormously wide scale. He is lecturing on rhetoric and particularly on the theory of language, which is much more extraordinary than I think people have given it credit for being. He is lecturing on the, on jurisprudence, a very fashionable subject in a city like Edinburgh, which has a large legal population and um, where, where people are seriously interested in legal education. And what he is doing 
is he is constructing um, something that David Hume called a science of man, um, a study of the principles of human nature as they are formed in us all by our experience of living in civil society. Now, um, and uh, living in civil society, learning to cooperate, learning to exchange, learning to communicate using the powers of language and all the rest of it. It's, it's a study of the socialization of the individual personality um, and a study of how that happens in different types of civilization. Now, the thing is that it, this is the wider context, I think, in which one needs to see his interest in political economy taking shape. And we, we know exactly when and how it started to take shape. And it did so in the process of lecturing on um, jurisprudence and on the, um, the study of how it is um, that human beings in their ordinary living in particular societies and particular civilizations begin to acquire the notion that um, acquire a, a, a sense of justice. We cannot, I mean, one of Smith's major prop propositions is we can't function in civil society unless somehow um, an idea that there is a thing called justice and that we have feelings about justice. We have feelings that when people are wronged um, or treated unfairly, that those who've done it need to be punished. A sense of, injust of justice and injustice is absolutely essential to our ability to survive in any form of society known to history. Now, the interesting thing is that one of the components of, of I mean, Smith said, well, what, where do we get this from? Um, it's going to be profoundly influenced by the state of, by the distribution of property and whether we own property or we, whether we don't own property. But it's also going to be profoundly influenced by the way in which the rules of justice, the laws, are administered by any form of government. Um, if we feel that, the, um, that, 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 that um, government has fallen into the hands of tyrants or incompetence, we're likely to feel that our own interests are being, um, are being undermined. We're likely to feel that we're being treated unfairly. Our sense of justice is going to be offended. Now, this is the, the more immediate territory in, Smith, in which Smith starts to ask essentially economic questions. And the, the way he asks them is extremely interesting. He said, well, what, is the one of the, or what are the important functions of government that have to be administered fairly um, if uh, rulers are going to find that, they have, that, that they're ruling over um, a stable, relatively contented form of society? One of them is going to be about the price of commodities. Um, and this is the point um, at which he starts to ask questions about how are we to talk about the, fair, the, the, the price of commodities um, and fairness in administering commodities. And this is where Smith comes through with his first insights into the fact that um, within an economically functioning polity, with a government, with laws to administer, we are actually going to be more content if we are given more ability to look after our own interests, unencumbered by artificial rules and inhibitions and regulations and so forth. In other words, the notion of a market um, and of the regulation of the market is absolutely at the forefront of his thinking um, about how, how we should start to address the problems of an economy. Um, and as I say, it comes into this discussion of, of government, of justice, of fairness, and all of that needs to be seen as part of a much wider project, a, a, I mean, a colossal project, um, for developing a science of man which will explain, as I say, the circumstances under which we become the people we are, and in which the societies we live in become the sort of societies we recognize as being our own. Okay, well, I... Now, that's, that's the point of entry. And what we know, uh, what we, can, we, we can be sure that Smith was thinking in these terms, just the terms I've given now, uh, when he was in his late 20s in Edinburgh. What he will do after 1752, when he becomes professor of moral philosophy at Glasgow, 
if he will start working on that problem alongside and in joint harness with the problems of, uh, uh, of considering the process of socialization which he develops in the theory of moral sentiments. So in many respects, what I think is fascinating and important is that Smith's reasoning um, um, about, uh, that is, uh, forms the backbone um, of his two great published books takes place simultaneously. Um, although, uh, as I say, he chooses, for reasons best known to himself, to complete the work on the theory of moral sentiments and the theory of socialization and the ethical implications of that before sitting down and really opening up the questions of trying to understand the dynamics of, 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 the, of the trading process. But there's a certain, as you point out, what you're really saying is that there's a certain um, synergy that runs through both great works. And I was going to ask you this later, but I'll bring it up now. There's this great issue. I think Smith has been caricatured terribly, tragically, along the lines of he wrote one book about how you should be a nice person. Uh, that was the theory of moral sentiments. And then he wrote this other book about how it's okay to be not nice. <laughs> You can be self selfish or self interested, and that's the, the the wealth of nations, and that's clearly not correct. It's clearly not the way Smith saw human beings. That was not his science of man. There really isn't a schizophrenic aspect to this. There's a, a unity. There's a, a wholeness to it, and it seems to me, and I'd like your reaction. It seems to me that the wholeness is about. He he didn't use the word so much, but. Competition runs through all of his work, in the, not in the way we use it as a modern, but in the sense of we're all interacting with each other, aware of the fact that there are others out there that offer us both alternatives and judgment and assessment and friendship and profit and bargains and etc. So when you start talking about his interest in regulations and – and the system of government, he obviously was very concerned about government, government's role in creating or inhibiting competition. He was very aware that the role of self-interested merchants would play in, in, in creating artificial impediments to competition. And, similar, and he wanted those to be taken away because I think partly he saw that in the interpersonal sphere, which is the world of the theory of moral sentiments – he saw how the fact that I had to interact with others in a marketplace of morality would create good things. And therefore, when I interacted in a marketplace of commerce, those same forces would encourage me to do things that would end up serving my, my fellow human beings. That's the orderliness that he sees, and he sees it the way I see it, and, and you comment, please. He sees it driven – by competition, not the way a modern would talk about it, but the way he talked about it, which was you have alternatives. You're searching. You're looking for a bargain. You're looking for friendship. You're looking for respect. You're looking for the esteem of your friends. And similarly, you're doing the same thing in the commercial world, and it's all working together. What do you think? I think that's absolutely right. Um, I would just modify slightly the, 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 the slightly dodgy word – um, is the word competition, if you see it from Smith's point of view. The crucial notion is exchange. I mean, he says somewhere um, that we spend our lives in exchanging things. Yeah, that's a better word. That's, that's, that that and, and avoids... Really, I, I think if you want um, a key word, a key concept to his entire understanding of the human condition, it is that we are constantly engaged in a process of exchange. We exchange goods, we exchange our services, we exchange sentiments. And we do it from the moment of our birth um, to the moment of our death. And um, the, thing, the thing that is so interesting about this, um, uh, and I, 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 I always tell people that it's well worth turning to the recovered text of his lectures on jurisprudence to see how Smith prefaces his discussion of political economy, because he, what he does is he spends the first 10 pages or so talking about um, the human condition. 
Um, why are we different from the animals? The, the, the reason is simply because we're, we're the most indigent of species. And so in order to survive, we've had to cooperate. In order to, have to, to cooperate, we've had to invent language. And what does cooperation and with the use of language mean? It's about exchange. Um, and exchange, as you rightly say, when, it, when it's um, discussed, in the theory of moral sentiments. It's about trading. We trade sentiments with each other. Um, we trade sentiments looking for a sort, of, um, 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 a sort of psychological deal with people. It's nice to, um, to, to have a discussion with people um, and to feel that what we're saying is, is, is regarded with sympathy, um, with approval, um, uh, but we, and we relish the process of trading our ideas with us, ourselves. It's what happens um, in any tutorial in any university, in, in, in any conversation in a pub. And so the, the process he's describing in the theory of moral sentiments, um, uh, um, uh, um, as the one that regulates our social life, is exactly the same as the process which he is um, discuss discussing uh, when we trade our goods and services. Um, and there's a wonderful throwaway remark he makes in which he says, you know, we spend all our life trying to persuade people. That's why rhetoric matters so much to his thing. Um, rhetoric matters to the market. What are we doing when we're trading? We are, in fact, we're, we're using our persuasive powers, we're, uh, our persuasive arts. And so that notion of exchange um, is, I, I think, the most useful way of putting it. To, put, to, to, to talk about competition, I think, is much more iffy um, and much more dangerous because it implies um, a much more naked, um, uh, um, uh, self-interested um, impulse in us than I think Smith thought we, uh, we had. Well, let me, let me correct that and, and, and say it in a better way because when I use – I don't mean competitive. I don't mean that – although I think – he certainly was aware of people's desire to to climb the, the ladders of status, uh, and so in that sense, he he was very aware of that kind of competition. I meant it in a more economic sense of the term in economics, and it's a word that gets abused a lot. So let me try to say it in a more simple way. Okay, I, I think Smith was was ex was focused on a very simple aspect of competition, which is more is better. <laughs> that is. If you have more choices, if you have more people to trade with, you're going to prosper in ways that you won't if you only have a few people to trade with. So at one extreme, you have a small village where there's only one supplier of something that you desperately want. And at the other extreme, you have a world where you have lots of suppliers to choose from. And I mean Smith to me is – Perhaps greatest economic insight, which has taken me decades to fully appreciate, that's not obvious. I mean, everyone would, will tell you that the you know the invisible hand is a great contribution. His contributions against mercantilism obviously are incredibly important, but neglected it, it seems to me by modern economists until very recently. His insight that the division of labor is limited by the extent of the market, the idea that the more people you have to trade with. Not only will they have to treat you better, which is the modern sense in which competition matters, not only will they not have a monopoly over you and exploit you, but the deeper, extraordinary insight of Smith, and we've done a couple of podcasts on this, we'll put links to it, the idea that as you expand the, 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 the breadth of who you trade with, the tools and the way you create is going to be different. And you're going to get the potential for wealth. You're going to get the potential to avoid subsistence, to avoid misery. And it's hard to do that in a small world with only a few traders and a few suppliers. It's possible to do that in a world – you can create wealth when you have a little bit of modernity, a little bit of the expansive opportunities to trade. So when I invoked competition earlier – that's what I meant. And that aspect of exchange, that is the wideness of exchange, it doesn't quite work in the moral philosophy, the moral sentiment world because we don't interact morally with thousands. We interact with, with our sphere of neighbors and family. He talks about that incessantly. The, the people we 
touch with our words and with our eyes and with our, our, our hands our, that we shake hands with and hug and all that. That's a small circle. But he saw in the wealth of nations that there was this larger circle that we could interact with and exchange with commercially. And he saw that that was it, – it, it allowed some things that, that weren't obvious. What do you think of that? Um, I think what you're doing is you're pushing the discussion of the wealth of nations beyond um, – uh, entirely legitimately, I may say – beyond where Smith leaves it on the text. And I think it's, and I think your contrast with the situation that obtains in the theory of moral sentiments, where in fact, as you rightly say, I mean, our social world is confined to relatively few people, um, and um, uh, is, is, is entirely right. But I think, um, I mean, the thought I would give you um, is that I do think that the notion of the market in the wealth of nations is much less um, finely tuned than we tend to think. Totally agree. Um, totally agree. Um, <laughs> it, it, um, because the people he's talking about who are, um, uh, um, uh, uh, um, whose economic behavior really interests him are people, largely agricultural people, um, who are locked into the economy of a world which is just emerging from the sort of closed economy that is represented by a late feudalism. And um, these are the people whose ambitions are being stirred in Smith's discussion. These are the people who simply want a bit of security, um, uh, which will give them freedom to improve their own lot and make their own lot convenient. That's the word he uses. Now, this is a very modest level of motivation he's talking about, but he comes back to this situation again and again and again. He invokes, you're absolutely right, um, and it's part of the uh, literary magic, if you'd like to call it that, of the wealth of nations, is of a colossal market. But the interesting thing is, he doesn't, um, uh, it's in, in his discussion of the development of um, um, uh, national economies, he never really moves much beyond the the um, uh, the operation of the market in particular regions, um, and I'm thinking particularly of the regions of, of Britain, which is very much in his his, his sidelines at this stage. The notion of, of of those regions being grossed up to a market which an internal national market which has complicated relations between its different sectors. He is surprisingly reluctant to do that. And I think the reasons may well be polemical um, uh, with that. He he is not... um, um, I think Smith is very anxious in right the way through the wealth of nations not to be a utopian, not to try and envisage how the market will develop. Um, uh, you know, beyond our own historical reach or beyond the reach of our own generation or rather beyond the reach of the, of the, of the present generation of our rulers who are the people who are the ultimate target, I think, for this book. Um, and so, although I think you're absolutely right about the general tendency of where the notion of, of competition and markets goes, I think it is interesting, and whether you will think this is important economically, I leave to you, but uh, but as a historian, I do find it significant that he chooses, I think, quite deliberately to rein back his understanding uh, of what the market is in favor of just trying to focus once again uh, on the things that will change people's patterns of exchanging goods and services um, in particular regional contexts. Now, this may strike you as, um, um, as, as being historian, uh, historian being excessively cautious and so forth, and it may well be that, that this is right. But I still find it, I still find that that, that imbalance slightly interesting. That's a great point. So in other words, I think to come back to your um, um, original remark, I do think actually, um, if it's discussed at this level, the sort of behavior he's, discu- he's discussing in the theory of moral sentiments which basically does not stretch much beyond the region of our own family, friends, um, and, and acquaintances, um, really 
is extended into the actual text of the wealth of nations. Although I do agree that the wealth of nations stretches far beyond the reach of that text. But he, I think he leaves it to others to make that stretch. Oh, I, t- I totally agree with you. And I think just as um, in the theory of moral sentiments, he's dealing with a, a small circle of intimates and acquaintances who influence our behavior, those insights are, are applicable today to a world where because of the web and television and print, uh, our reputations go way beyond a small circle. And absolutely. similarly, I think in the, in, the, in the Wealth of Nations, those insights, I think you're, you're, you're absolutely correct that he, that he made narrower assessments then. But, but I think we can the, – the wisdom of Smith is that they, were, they had more, a more general application. Let me, let me ask you a stylistic question that fascinates me and, and, and curious if you have any thoughts on this. One of the things I really enjoyed about your book are some of the quotes from Smith's predecessors uh, and teachers, people like Hume, people like uh, Hutchison in particular, and some of his contemporaries. One of the things that struck me about those is that Smith's a much more entertaining and accessible writer. And when I picked up the theory of moral sentiments, uh, my colleague Dan Klein here at George Mason approached me and said, I'd like to, maybe we could do a podcast on this. And I'd looked at the book when I'd been in, and read some of it when I was in graduate school. So I picked it up again. And I thought, well, this will be fun. And I started reading. And after about three pages, I thought, you know, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to pull this off. Uh, it's, it, I can't read it. it it's not, uh, I'm not enjoying it. And it sort of starts in the middle. Um, it's a bizarrely, to me, structured book. But I thought, well, I've already committed to this. I'll push on. And very shortly after that, I, there were many deep rewards from reading that book in its original, not reading some modern assessment of it. But reading Hutchison, I suspect, for a modern is, is quite difficult. And similarly, um, The Wealth of Nations, much of it, not all of it, but much of it is, is delightful to read. His, his prose is, is clear to a modern. His sentence structure is – occasionally, it's a lo- he writes longer sentences – than a modern would would normally write. But I just wonder, you know, we think of Smith the way I think some people think of John Maynard Keynes. You know, before John Maynard Keynes, there was no economics about macro and business cycles. This isn't true. There were there was all kinds of books on it. He eclipsed them. And similarly, Smith eclipsed the thinkers of his day. I wonder how much of it, obviously he was a, a very wise and talented man, but style play some role in that. And I think style hampers a little bit the theory of moral sen- sentiments, and style is one of the great successes of the Wealth of Nations. What do you think, what role did style play in those books having the impact they did and in the fact that we don't read Hutchison and and uh, and those those folks anymore? I think take your last point first. Um, I, I absolutely agree with you that you feel you've entered a different world when you move from Hutchison's. Uh, to Smith. I mean, something, something has happened uh, to moral philosophy, uh, to the whole approach of how you study human behavior. Um, and it's got everything, it, it, come, it comes through in, in, in style. I think in general terms about Smith's style, what one should say is that Smith, first of all, wrote extremely slowly. Um, and he says himself that, you know, he was constantly writing, rewriting, doing and undoing his prose. And he said he was never, ever satisfied with it. But the other thing which I think is very curious about his style is that he, he, he seems to have started off composing uh, by dictating. Um, we don't know, we, we know astonishingly little about how exactly he composed. Um, but he, um, he, uh, at an early stage, he seems to have relied on a clerk um, to listen to his dictation, to put together a text. And he then seems to have worked on it, reworked on it, reworked on it. So what you're getting in Smith is very, very heavily um, uh, manufactured prose. You said and you I said think, you said a Clark, right? Yeah. In in, in America, he had a Clark. I in, mean, um, in America, we would call it a clerk. For those oh, you, right. you those of you listening at home, um, so he hired someone to take notes for it for him. Uh, uh, no, to take dictation. Yeah. He dictated his books. In, um, I think my, my guess is, for, um, from what li- little we know 
um, and for putting it together, I think probably he dictated a first draft and then worked it over. But worked it over and reworked it over and reworked it over. But I think one of the things that's quite interesting in this is if you compare that with the style of David Hume, particularly when Hume is writing about economics, Hume writes very, very fast. And I think that's a lot of the charm of, um, of uh, Hume's economic writing. It really does flow. Um, and he uses an essay, an essay format, which is a pretty concentrated format, um, um, and does not allow for m much exposition. But, um, it, uh, but I think the contrast and Smith's writing habits do make it clear that he really is, he, he is out on his own as a stylist. Um, I don't quite agree with you about finding uh, the theory of moral sentiments hard going. Um, once one starts to add in um, what I came to, uh, to, to a conclusion about when I was writing my book, that the, the thing comes to life if you realize that the theory of moral sentiments is a book that is designed um, to uh, answer um, Jean-Jacques Rousseau's um, deeply pessimistic uh, views about the civilizing process, a civilizing process which destroys the human personality, which fundamentally, by its very nature, corrupts the human personality and turns us into people who are unrecognizable even to ourselves. Smith wants to, uh, wants to play with that and uh, to say that, um, in a sort of way, Rousseau is, um, is right to take that line, it is certainly the case that commercial activity um, in, 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 in social life, in economic life, is uh, activity that does change our personalities. But the question of whether it corrupts us, makes us unfit to life, lead a, re a decent um, ethical life, if he thinks, uh, 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 Rousseau thinks he's got that, uh, that, that I'm so sorry, that um, uh, Smith thinks Rousseau's just got that wrong. And I think that um, you get a story coming out of the theory of moral sentiments once you realize that that strategy um, is, the, is, is the organizational strategy uh, which he used to um, discuss the civilizing process. Um, um, but um, I do think that those two books, anyway, taken by themselves, are one-offs, you know. Um, Smith is Smith as a stylist. There isn't anyone else like him. Um, and um, it's something that, that, that contemporaries periodically commented on. They, he was he was known to be a, to be a good writer. He, well, he was known to be a, 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 he was known he, he was thought to be an extremely verbose writer. <laughs> um, not in the sense of using words unnecessarily, but um, um, people like much more pithy reasoning about essentially philosophical principles. Well, he throws in um, a lot of metaphor and, and examples, which yes. makes which is part of the reason he's got uh, the accessibility most of the time. Of course, sometimes his examples for a modern are a little bit obscure. We don't know always what he's talking about because we're right. because they're they're written for his day. But most of the time, we do understand it, uh, and and I think that is a. He wasn't. He didn't see that as degrading in any way. To leave, to come down off the mountain and and talk about some mundane example to illustrate his points. And I, I well, I, I think that what you're saying is it, it's absolutely right. And, and it, um, his examples were often commented uh, co commented on. Um, Smith was he, he, uh, occasionally, in the terms you're suggesting, that, um, uh, that perhaps there were over over many um, examples, but everyone admired him for the precision with which his examples are given. And um, my explanation of that is that his method of reasoning um, um, required him to put an enormous amount of stress on examples. Because actually, the method he uses, which is essentially a mathematical method, um, is to uh, uh, advance a general proposition which will appeal to everyone's sort of common sense. Um, and, uh, but then, in fact, all he would be able to do to increase its um, truth value will be to illustrate it. And um, it, so illustrations are not the same as evidence in, um, a sort of, uh, um, in, in, in terms of the thinking of someone who's applying the scientific method. 
He is not producing his examples and then developing um, a hypothesis about how, how markets work or whatever, or the principle of division of labor. He did it the other way around. He is offering a general proposition um, um, about some aspect of human behavior. And he's then saying, well, all I can do, um, I can suggest you think about this. I can suggest you think that this proposition, which is probably one that we've all known or had in the back of our mind for some time, and um, that we think much more deeply about it. Um, and in order to increase its plausibility, I'm going to give you, um, I'm, I'm going to illustrate this up to the hilt with examples taken from a contemporary life, taken from history. Yeah. No, and the, so these examples are crucial. They're there to give truth value to propositions which are merely suggestions. They're plausible suggestions, very often drawn from the language of everyday life in the 18th century. So I think maybe the analogy – I don't know if this is a good analogy or not, but you mentioned the influence of, of Simpson on him, his math teacher. Exactly. But if I think about what would be this the sort of mathematical equivalent – it would be something like there are an infinite number of prime numbers. Well, can you prove it? Well, I can't prove it, but here's a really big one. That will give you pause because you probably thought after 100 or 200 or 300, they'd run out because they're so, these numbers are so big. They must have things that, that will go into them other than themselves and the number one. So if I can keep giving you more and more of these bigger and bigger numbers that are prime, maybe you'll start to think that it's a plausible idea. And certainly in the area of human behavior, where we're not, despite modern economics, we're not really amenable to equations, uh, it's, not a, uh, it's not a bad approach. Uh, I think it's a very good approach, and, but I think it's, uh, it's crucially important that, um, that this sort of approach is remembered when uh, people are thinking about Smith, because um, it does put pay to the notion that economics is never going to be an exact science, or indeed that any of the human sciences are going to be exact sciences. In the last resort, all we can do is offer general propositions which are drawn from the experience of everyday life, which we wish to develop. And the only way we can develop them um, and increase their truth value is by illustrating them uh, in a convincing manner, and then, in fact, offering this as something that, well, in Smith's case, our governors should think about. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, he's not offering them propositions, scientific propositions, in, in any sense we would understand now. He's offering them, um, he's offering them plausible hypotheses, which he is saying um, a wise legislator ought to think about when he is doing his basic business um, of enforcing the rules of justice. Well, we're almost out of time. I, I, I want to first say that when I said that the theory of moral sentiments is a, is a little bit inaccessible, I only meant the first, the first bit. It, right. it, I meant as a marketing approach for selling a book, um, a modern would have suggested maybe a little bit of, oh, I don't know, some idea of what he's going to be talking about. He sort of just jumps in. And in, in the Wealth of Nations, he's much more um, – he sets the table a little bit more um, – easy, easy, in a more easy way. But, but what I want to close with is something you talk about in the book that I found, found so interesting. We have with the, the Wealth of Nations a book that launches um, modern economics and launches a question that never has stopped to intrigue and fascinate economists, which is the question of growth. Uh, Smith really is the first person to write about that. He gives a theory of growth. He, he talks about the division of labor and specialization, a theory that I think is still at the, should be at the center of every understanding of, of growth and, and, and thereby also of poverty. So what, what is uh, fascinating that you point out in the book is he's writing this at a time when growth is pretty anemic, by, certainly by modern standards. Um, his life and the world he grew up in was not a dynamic world. He wrote before the Industrial Revolution, and there's a certain extraordinary irony and prescience to that. So how did you think he came to be interested in a question that seemingly would be almost a theoretical question? What causes nations to thrive? Golly, um, that is a... That's a cracker to produce at the end of a 
discussion. Um, I don't think there is um, a simple answer to this. I think part of the answer may be that he came to this interest pretty late in, his, in the development of his economic thinking. I'm, I'm attracted by the notion that a book two of The Wealth of Nations, which deals with the accumulation of with stock and the accumulation of stock. Which by stock he meant capital. Capital. Um, the, uh, the, the importance of capital to economic growth. Yep. Um, but this is an, um, this, this dimension of economic thinking was one that he learned from the physiocrats in Paris. Uh, which he visited um, in six, uh, well, when he was visiting in the early 60s um, with, um, uh, I'm so sorry, I don't mean the early 60s, I mean the later 60s, uh, with the young Duke of Bacou, who he was taking round France on the Grand Tour. He meets with and likes the um, physiocrats, although he disagrees fundamentally at every level with what they're doing, but they're serious people to be taken seriously. But I do, I, I'm inclined to accept the idea that the importance of capital to, um, uh, 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 to growth is a late development. And I have a suspicion that um, he actually starts to theorize the business of growth as opposed to natural evolution, um, uh, which will occur when, um, uh, 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 you know, with the natural growth of, 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 of an economy. That this is something that is relatively late. In, in, it comes relatively late into his economic development. But I'm, 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 I'd love to discuss that with other people at the moment. It's very difficult, I mean, difficult to get any textual hold on that. But I do think that if you look at his the historical theory, his, his, his wonderful insights, actually, into the progress of civilization from its hunter-gatherer state through its pastoral nomadic state, through its feudal state, into the commercial state of the modern world, that isn't so much about, it's not really about capital accumulation. It's not really about growth in the sense that we would understand it or economists would understand it now. Uh, progress does not mean growth uh, in, that, in, in that particular context. As I say, I, I slightly dodged the question of, um, of where this interest in growth comes from because I really have not found, I've, I've not been confident in handling um, really the impact of, um, uh, of uh, physiocratic thinking on Smith's relatively late um, theoretical thinking uh, in, in, in the 1760s. But there was... So that's, I'm, giving you a very, I'm giving you a very weak answer to an extremely interesting and important question. Well, it's not, it's not an answerable question. It's a question for speculation. But, but definitely in his day, he did – his world, the narrower world of, of, of his town and his, the places he taught at and worked at, there was change in the air. And he must have noticed that. He must – as you write about, he must have seen – that, that things were in motion in a way they hadn't been 200 and 300 and 500 years before. Oh, that is true. Um, and what he sees um, is the growth of luxury. And this preoccupation with luxury, with consumption, and with consumption and with fashion, this is something that um, the history of that, well, it's got a long history, but the immediate history of that is of the past two generations. Um, and I think myself at that level... Um, the vital text for Smith, the, the text that never goes away for, from him, is um, Bernard Mandeville's Fable of the Bees. Um, it's a text he was brought up on by Francis Hutcheson. It's a text he has with him all his life, and at the very end of his life, uh, when he's um, revising his theory of moral sentiments and reflecting on the state um, of moral philosophy, um, he says, you know, that... Um, although he, uh, um, Mandeville is very cynical about the growth of it, the escalation of consumption of luxury um, uh, um, and the absurd demands of fashion on, on the market, um, um, although the, uh, Mandeville is unduly cynical about this, um, he says that nevertheless um, there are truths here um, uh, um, which, which could not be denied. 
And I think, uh, I think um, what has happened is that he's moving the discussion beyond Mandeville. Um, and he's trying to do it by saying that um, luxury consumption is not in itself um, despicable, as, um, uh, as, as um, Mandeville has said, because the invisible hand um, and um, ordinary judgment of ordinary people uh, will, in fact, regulate its, um, its, its, its bad effects. But, even, but that still is a moral argument. The interesting thing is that where does the moral argument turn into a purely economic argument? And where I say the only link I can think in that chain is the very, very um, formal uh, uh, um, economic reasoning that he gets out of Kenne and the physiocrats in Paris. It's very interesting. Uh, we're, talk very briefly. I'd love to talk about that well, more. If, go, if there are people. Yeah, go ahead. You, you, talk a little bit about the fable of the bees and. and Summarize what what Mandeville's theme is there, and, and what Smith's reaction was. You, you say he's cynical, but he's more than cynical. He's 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 pessimistic in a, in a way that Smith was not. Yes, um, Mandeville is committed to the the view that all human behavior is motivated by pride and shame. Absolutely everything. It's pride and shame that um, will ultimately be responsible for making us the human beings, the social animals that we are. Um, and pride, um, uh, and, and in fact, pride is all-consuming, and it feeds on every, um, all the, the, the products of the earth that we have around us. We will use, we will appropriate, we will appropriate products, we will use our families, we will use our friends, in fact, to enhance our pride um, um, and to mitigate our shame. Um, he was he was onto case, something. It, sorry, <laughs> he was onto something there. Oh, he is. I <laughs> mean, um, Mandeville is one of the great great stylists of the 18th century. Extraordinary book. It's hilarious. I mean, I used to find every time I taught um, uh, Mandeville, every student goes for Mandeville. Everyone knows that Mandeville's talking the truth. But it is very cynical because it means that everything everything we get, we, we associate with society. Virtue, honor, wisdom, taste, all the things we do are simply motivated by pride and by shame. Um, um, and the proofs, the way he argues it, is, is brilliant and it's hilariously funny. Now, the thing is that um, uh, um, Smith was introduced to this text by Francis Hutchison, and Francis Hutchison was obsessed with it. Um, in many ways, all his moral philosophy is written to try and refute the cynicism um, in, uh, uh, um, in this, and to show that, in fact, um, not, uh, it, 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 it can't be the case that all human motivation is simply driven by pride and shame. Some must be, in some sense, altruistic. Um, and as I say, uh, that is the legacy, that's part of the baggage which Glasgow University uh, hands on to Smith. Um, and it recurs again and again and again. And one of the reasons he gets interested in Jean-Jacques Rousseau and Jean-Jacques Rousseau's extraordinary um, pessimistic discussions of the civilizing process is because Jean-Jacques Rousseau himself uh, read and knew The Fable of the Bees mm -hmm. and refashioned it in, 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 a, in a quite a syncretic way. And indeed, uh, what some people don't realize is that Smith's first published uh, philosophical work is a review of uh, Rousseau's book, um, which, in which he does something that no other reviewer did, was to couple it uh, with Mandeville. Hmm. It's right at the front of his mind when he's writing the theory of moral sentiments. It's right at the, at the front of his mind um, uh, um, but to the end of his life when, as I say, he admits that so, there are some truths so deeply embedded in Mandeville that they're always going to be there. But he does want to take the culpability of satire out of this. He doesn't want, he doesn't want to, to end up with the conclusion that human beings are therefore a despicable race, that all our behavior um, is driven by self, by self-interest, and all the rest of it. Because, and why that? Because he comes, he comes back to the notion that actually we tend to despise people whose, whose motivation seems to us to be purely self-driven. So you, you, um, quote, and, you quote in the book one of, my, one of my favorite quotes, and I'm going to only paraphrase it because I don't know it by heart, but it, the sentiment is so profound. He says, Smith says in The Theory of Moral Sentiments, 
man wants to be loved and he wants to be lovely. That is, sure, we wanted people to think highly Absolutely. of us, but we want to earn it. We want to actually care that we merit that love. And that's, that's the distinction, correct? Yes, absolutely. You're quite right. It's one of my, it really is it's one of my favorite quotes, too. Uh, it's pure philosophical poetry, that. Yeah, I agree. My guest today has been Nicholas Philipson. Nicholas, thank you so much for being part of Econ Talk. Thank you very much. I've enjoyed it enormously. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.